progress of physics seems to come in fits and starts. The really great pinnacles, the revolutionary discoveries, the great transformations of ideas come very infrequently. Perhaps in the last 200 years, there's only been half a dozen such things. You might think of uh, Newton's discovery of the laws of mechanics and gravitation, Maxwell's theory of electricity and magnetism, Einstein's theory of relativity, and in the 20th century, the theory of quantum mechanics. I think we're due for a new one. I think very soon we'll have another great transformation of ideas in which, during which we discover the ultimate understanding of the forces between nuclear particles. Now, with every great pinnacle of discovery, there is a long preliminary process of gathering information, sorting it down a little bit, and getting it prepared to be understood. For example, for the law of gravitation, there was first the observations of the motions of the planets, then a certain amount of partial understanding, such as Copernicus's idea that the planets went around the sun, and later Kepler's discovery that they went in ellipses. But the final, ultimate uh, law of gravitation required all this preliminary jockeying of the data around to understand it partially. In the same way, the, the future discovery of the laws of nuclear physics, of nuclear interactions, is preceded by a partial summation of the information that's available so far. And just recently, we've had one of the most important and dramatic uh, reshufflings of our understanding so that I think they were almost ready to get the answer to the big question. What I want to tell you about today is the, this partial understanding that we just achieved. Some time ago, things looked pretty simple. We just had the uh, theory that the atoms had, on the outside, electrons, and on the inside, nuclei, and that the nuclei were made of nothing but two particles in the world, the neutrons and the protons. And then, with such a simple picture, two, just two nuclear particles, a nuclear problem was just to understand the simple law of force between neutron and proton. Probably some simple law, like the electrical law, that the force varies inversely as the square of the distance, or some other beautifully simple thing was all that had to be found out. So, a program was launched to study the interactions of neutrons and protons, and it was discovered, as time went on, that the law looked a little more complicated, ultimately, that it was extremely complicated, that it was as complicated as it could be, that the force between neutrons and protons depended upon practically everything, and it depended upon how far apart they were in a very complicated way. It depends upon how they're, which direction they're spinning, uh, what direction they approach each other relative to the way they're spinning, and so on. In fact, it depends on everything that it can depend on, and it's as complicated as it can be, except for one little thing, which I'll mention later. Now, when a thing looks complicated, it's possible that we're looking at it wrong and that we're missing some of the pieces of the puzzle. And as a matter of fact, there was direct evidence that pieces were missing in the fact that in cosmic rays, the fast particles which come from the outside somewhere, in the study in cosmic rays, uh, it was found that there were some new particles, other particles, besides a neutron and proton. First, there were some mesons, which were partially expected, and then there were another group of heavier objects, one of which was called a lambda meson, and it was found to disintegrate into a proton and one of the mesons sometimes. Sometimes it disintegrates into a neutron and one of the mesons. The cosmic rays also discovered still another particle called a cascade particle, which itself disintegrates into a lambda. Now, uh, the progress with cosmic rays was very slow and was very much speeded up by the development of modern accelerators, which produce particles as fast and as energetic as those in the cosmic rays, so that we, so to speak, have brought the thing under our own control, rather than to have to wait for the odd fast particle and reaction to occur in nature. In addition, we've developed better instruments for observing the particles instead of cloud chambers, bubble chambers. And with these bubble chambers and modern accelerators, the progress in finding new particles has rapidly increased. Five years ago, we were up to 30 particles. Now, we have 90 particles. So the problem has gotten a little more complicated. We used to just worry about how the things acted. Now we have to divide the problem into two parts. We have to go back a step. First, have to decide what there is in the world, and then how does the stuff act. So we have to now figure out what the pattern is of available particles. In other words, what kind of a world, what the particles are that are in the world. They're First thing, it turns out that they become in families. For example, the neutron and proton are very similar. 
They have the same mass and they have other characteristics in common. But the most remarkable characteristic is this, that although the forces between neutrons and protons, and protons and protons are very complicated, the force between a neutron and proton and a, between a proton and proton are the same. That's a very mysterious accident. It's only true of the nuclear part of the force. The electrical forces, of course, are different. One is charged and one is neutral. But the nuclear part of the forces we've discovered has one peculiar characteristic. That is that you can change a neutron for a proton and it doesn't make any difference to the force. We say that the uh, nuclear forces have a symmetry. They have the symmetry that you can change neutron to proton without making any difference. The fact that we use the word symmetry here is a kind of a technical use of that word. Uh, what is a symmetrical thing? How would you define a, sy a symmetrical thing? Well, one definition is that a symmetrical thing is something that you can do something to and it doesn't make any difference. In this book, for example, I could turn it over and it looks the same. There's something I can change something and do something to it and it still looks the same. And in this, we use the same word in the physics then to represent the fact that I can change a neutron to a proton and the nuclear forces look the same. So neutron and proton together form a family as far as nuclear forces are concerned. And it turns out that the cascade particle is a member of a family of two, one negative and one neutral. The lambda stands by itself, but there is another particle, a set of three particles that are similar that also get exchanged uh, and produce a family of the kind that the neutron and proton produce. Besides families, we found out that there are hierarchies between these particles. For example, lambda disintegrates into a neutron and a meson, or sometimes into a proton and a meson, and that it does very slowly. It takes a third of a billionth of a second. It sounds like that's pretty fast, but for nuclear reaction, nuclear particles, that's very slow. It should happen almost a billion times more rapidly if there weren't something in the way. In order to analyze this something in the way in these disintegrations, Professor Gelman uh, here at Caltech invented a, a method of description which describes the situation. He said that in a sense the lambda has a kind of character that has difficulty in disintegrating into a neutron and a proton. And he makes the rule that if you want to disintegrate with change of character, it should be slow. And thus is able to associate character, a kind of character to the different particles in which he gives a numerical number. He calls this one, he calls this number strangeness. He says, this is strangeness number zero. This is strangeness one. You'd think actually he called it with a minus sign, but that's just an accident of history. But then it turns out that the cascade particle here can't directly disintegrate a neutron and proton. It disintegrates slowly into a lambda, and then the lambda into neutron and proton. So the cascade particle has a character number minus two being two steps removed in the slow disintegrations to the neutron and proton. Well, then, that is some partial analysis of the particles that are in the world. There's these families of in for interchange, and there are these hierarchies associated with the strangeness. The question is, is there any more symmetry in the system?